Basically, this is our only source of entertainment during the streets. <laughs> like, we can't watch TV, we can't watch movies, we can't listen to music, we can't read novels. What we can do is we can <laughs> write lots of questions. <laughs> okay, let's start going through this. Since there's a lot of questions, I might give relatively brief answers to each one. It says, I find it helpful to bring to mind metta, karuna, mudita, and upeka at different times. So metta is loving kindness, karuna is compassion, mudita is sympathetic joy, and upeka is equanimity. For example, I might judge someone harshly, then bring up metta for the person, and karuna for the deluded self who judged harshly. Similarly, during meditation, I might bring up karuna for the physical pain in the room, and mudita for the mental purifying occurring. I might also bring up metta for deluded thoughts that may arise, karuna for the being thinking them, and upeka for their persistent recurrence. I feel these could be used outside the retreat setting as well. Could you give some practical guidance for using different Brahma Viharas in day-to-day -day life? Sounds like you've already got the concept pretty well nailed down. I don't really have anything to add to this. Yeah, it sounds like you've already figured it out. Yeah, the Brahma Viharas are not just something we do during meditation, it's something that we do all the time. Uh, it's just recognizing... Uh, well, well, one way that's useful to think about is, is in terms of their opposites. So what's the opposite of loving-kindness? Hostility, aversion. Um, what's the opposite of compassion? It's cruelty. It's wishing harm for others. What's the opposite of sympathetic joy? It's uh, envy or jealousy. And uh, what's the opposite of equanimity? It's agitation or disturbance. So then, in our day-to-day -day life, we're trying to not have those four things. We're trying to avoid uh, mind states of hostility, cruelty, jealousy, and agitation. So then, all day long, we're working on maintaining loving-kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity, because then we don't fall into these other uh, unwholesome or unpleasant mind states. So you've got the general idea of how to practice. Um, so yeah, just keep doing it all the time. Next question. I've taken the five precepts and no longer drink, drink alcohol, eat meat or fish, or have casual sex for three years now. I'm finding overspending, parenthesis, taking what isn't freely given, harder as well as some issues regarding white lies and gossip. Any suggestions? Mm. Well, first off, overspending, uh, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. If it's, um, if it's your money, then you can spend it however you like. The issue there is not one of precepts, but one of greed. The issue there is, uh, so it's not that you're stealing, it's that you're just building up your, your desire and your attachment to things that don't bring happiness. So that's still an issue, but it's not technically a, a precept issue. Uh, that's a minor point. I would still recommend, basically, before buying anything, just ask yourself, do I need this? Be honest with yourself. And then if you say, well, I don't need it, but I want it anyway. Well, then ask yourself, what benefit is this going to bring? Is this really going to help me in my practice? Um. And if the answer is that you don't need it, and that it's not going to help you in your practice, then seriously consider not getting it. <clears throat> seriously consider letting it go. Uh, and instead, just practice contentment with what you have. Uh, odds are you already have more than enough. Uh, odds are you already have what you need. Um, so practice being content with what you have. 
Something else you could do in its place, though, is uh, then thinking, well, what could I get for someone else? It's like, I really want to buy this thing for myself. What if I bought it for my friend instead? Wouldn't she like this quite a bit? So then buy it and give it to your friend. So you still get the wonderful experience of overspending, but you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but then you're doing it for a good reason. You're doing it for a beneficial cause. Just make sure you don't like walk out of the store and be like, well, actually, she wouldn't want it anyway. I think I'll just keep it for myself. So that's, that's missing the point. But making it clear you're buying it as a gift for somebody else. So a clear plan in mind and stick to the plan. Um, as for white lies and gossip, um, focus on the harm that you cause to others. Uh, so, uh, the issue of gossip is something that uh, is fairly personal to me because I've been targeted by malicious gossip uh, in the past. Um, it's quite harmful. It's quite destructive. Uh, and even what we think of as, as innocent gossip, like, can you believe what he said? Um, do you realize he still has that problem? Uh, it's like, well, it seems innocent enough, but still, what are we doing? Uh, we're unnecessarily spreading a bad reputation for somebody else. Uh, we're, we're harming that person's reputation. Uh, and also the, the tendency of gossip to morph beyond uh, what it originally started as. Um, so it starts as like, can you believe it? I saw John eat a cookie after work. And then he tells Drager, actually, John ate a whole box of cookies. And then Drager's like, John actually like robbed a liquor store at that point <laughs> and stole all their cookies as well as all the whiskey. And then, then before you know it, like John is like Hitler reborn. And it's like, well, how did that happen? You know, all John did was have a cookie when he didn't really need it. Um, so just watching, uh, watching how gossip gets out of hand quickly and how it, it can really hurt people quite a bit. So just as we don't want to be on the wrong end of gossip, then we also try to, to keep others uh, from being hurt in the same way. Uh, with white lies, it can be a little more challenging uh, to see the harm caused. Uh, instead, what I would encourage you to do is to practice creativity. So to ask yourself, first off, why are you seeking to lie in this situation? Are you trying to protect someone's feelings? Or are you trying to avoid saying something uncomfortable or unpleasant? Uh, why are you doing it? And then see if you can find a creative way to approach the same issue without lying. See if you can find a way to evade the issue or talk about it in a different way, or maybe just not talk about it at all. Talk about something totally different. See if you can find a way to achieve the same objective without actually telling a lie. So this does require a certain degree of uh, creative thinking and um, thinking outside the box, and it's not always as straightforward as it seems. Um, but see if you can try to protect your honesty. Uh, because as mentioned, once we start to permit ourselves to lie, uh, even in what seems like relatively minor or harmless ways, it, it has a way of building. Uh, it can have a way of getting out of hand. So, yeah, watch out for that. Okay, then on this side it says, can you please talk about social engagement and activism, parenthesis, climate, poverty, race, <coughs> uh, and Buddhism, and how it all makes sense if we're not fixed or separate? Well, uh, when we develop loving-kindness and compassion, then if we're genuinely developing those qualities, then it will manifest in action. It will manifest in working for the benefit of others, in trying to reduce the suffering of the world, in trying to bring about better circumstances uh, for all sentient beings. Um, so social engagement and activism can be a natural uh, product of our practice, and, and it can be part of our practice as a way of cultivating loving-kindness and compassion in a very real way. 
the important thing is to make sure that we're not uh, falling into anger or resentment or hatred, um, as seems to happen all too often uh, when with activism. So really making sure that the mind is firmly grounded in uh, following the precepts, in maintaining right speech, uh, and in protecting the mind against uh, unwholesome tendencies. <clears throat> As to how it all makes sense if we're not fixed or separate, um, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking here. Um, When you recognize that every single person you encounter, uh, that you have been that person at some point, that you've been in exactly the same situation they're in, and when you were in their situation, you wanted kindness and support, then the natural tendency is to offer kindness and support to everyone you meet. Um, or to take a different angle, the, uh, what we're ultimately trying to do in Buddhist practice is to uproot self-attachment. So actively engaging in acts of kindness and compassion is a way of reducing uh, self-obsession so that we can start to let go of that, that attachment to self. Let's see. One, is it true a person should be completely moral before he or she begins meditation? No, because then nobody would ever start. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, having some basis in morality tends to make it easier to get started. So there's a number of suttas where the Buddha talks about how morality helps one to establish non-remorse, so a mind that's free of regret, uh, a mind that has a, a certain degree of happiness and contentment, which then makes it easier to develop concentration. So morality as a, a foundation stone for meditation practice is something that's well, well established in the suttas. Um, but yeah, if you wait until you're perfectly moral, not going to happen, not going to happen. Technically speaking, the only beings who are completely moral are enlightened beings. The rest of us are immoral to some extent or another. It's just with some of us, it's a lot worse than with others. Uh, but uh, nobody, no unawakened being is completely moral. Two, can you please delve more into the Vipassana system of meditation practice? So that's what I was talking about all afternoon. I was talking about Vipassana. Um, so Vipassana is uh, usually translated as insight meditation. And so Vipassana is a, a very broad category that includes all forms of meditation that ultimately result in awakening. Uh, all forms of meditation that uh, work on permanently eliminating greed, hatred, and delusion. So the perception of impermanence is one of those. Uh, the perception of dukkha is also one of those. The perception of not-self is also one of those. Um, and actually the three of those turn out to be completely intertwined, interconnected. So, there's a lot of freedom to be creative with how you apply your meditation practice in specific. The Buddha didn't give a lot of specifics when it comes to meditation. What he did is he gave us, he gave us an outline or framework. Uh, so the, the edges are, are fairly well defined, and the goal is fairly well defined. But how we choose to navigate towards the goal within that framework is relatively open. It's relatively open for us to play with and experiment with different approaches, with different ways of, of handling it. So throughout the centuries, some teachers have developed very specific, precise, point-by-point -point, uh, training systems. And that works well for some people and not well for other people. Um, so the system I was trained in is much more free-form. 
Right? It's much more intuitive. It's much more about feeling where you are now, discerning where awakening is, and moving towards awakening. So that can take a lot of different forms. It can take uh, effectively infinite forms. Um, as long as it's moving in the direction of awakening, then it's insight meditation, it's vipassana. Um, these days, the word vipassana has come to be, uh, co-opted would be a strong word, uh, but the, the system taught by S.N. Goenka, which is a, a relatively popular meditation system, uh, refers to itself simply as vipassana which has led to a great deal of confusion of people thinking that vipassana means goenka meditation. Uh, but that's not true. Goenka meditation is one of the infinite varieties of vipassana, but it's not vipassana completely. It's just one particular kind of vipassana. So every now and then I'll, I'll be talking to someone and I'll ask, so what kind of meditation do you do? And they'll say, oh, I do vipassana. And like, okay, what kind? What variety? How are you practicing? What are you doing? And then it emerges that they're doing Goenka meditation. It's like, okay, that's fine. But then just stay, say from the start you're doing Goenka meditation. Now you talk to any uh, contemplative Buddhist and odds are they're doing Vipassana meditation. But they may be doing radically different kinds of Vipassana meditation. So again, I mostly talk about the perception of impermanence. Um, occasionally, I talk about uh, contemplation of the, of the elements, which is a way of developing the perception of not-self. Um, on rare occasion, I'll talk about other methods, such as um, uh, the perception of non-delight in regards to the whole world. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Sabaloke uh, anabirata sanya. The perception of non-delight non uh, in regard to the whole world. It's one of the meditation techniques the Buddha recommended. I see a few smiles. <laughs> yes, it actually is as fun as it sounds, if that's what you're wondering. Let's see. This one says, could you speak more about ignoring pleasant and unpleasant and just focusing on the raw data? I thought paying attention to pleasant, unpleasant, neutral was encouraged as part of the second foundation of mindfulness. Yes, I think the idea of a four-hour sit is very unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> the idea may be unpleasant, and the experience may be something totally different. Uh, let's wait and see what happens. Uh, a lot of Buddhist practice is about pushing our boundaries. It's about... Uh, getting right up to the edge of your comfort zone and pushing a bit beyond. And that varies for you, depending on where your line is, where your limits are. But just pushing that limit, pushing that comfort zone. What is it that you find too far? And go a little bit farther. Um, so coming back to the first part of the question though, so awareness of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, yeah, that is part of uh, the second foundation of mindfulness. In fact, that is the second foundation of mindfulness. Um, and that's one thing you can do. Uh, so it's not that in Buddhist practice we do everything all at once. And it's not that we do every single meditation technique in all of Buddhism all at the same time. <laughs> Uh, but rather, at any given time, we're using one or maybe two meditation techniques. You know, simultaneously, that is. And of course, you can switch between multiple techniques. And in fact, everyone should know at least half a dozen meditation techniques. But at any one moment, we're only practicing a single technique or possibly two techniques in tandem. For example, you might be doing loving kindness and mindfulness of the body at the same time. But I know that Abhidhamma purists would say that's technically impossible, but that's a side issue. I'm not going to go into that. Um, so there's a time of just observing pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. 
Uh, and, and that's awareness of feeling at a certain level. Uh, but in terms of, of understanding it, we also need to understand the, the raw sensation itself. So technically what we're noticing is we're seeing the sensation itself and we're aware that it is a sensation which we are likely to label as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. The sensation itself is not that. The sensation itself is just raw information. That's it. But we notice, well, my tendency is to call this an unpleasant sensation. So that's still that, that layer of, of the second foundation of mindfulness. It's aware of the tendency to label something a particular way. But when we're practicing uh, with, with pain in particular, uh, but really you can do this with anything, uh, with any sensation, uh, it's recognizing that there's the raw sensation itself, and then there's the determination of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral that we put on top of that, that we add to that. So that's not a necessary thing. We can have the raw sensation itself without there being anything wrong. So, for example, there's a sutta where the Buddha talks about how uh, when the mind is trained, uh, we have the ability to perceive the unpleasant as pleasant, the pleasant as unpleasant, or to transcend both pleasant and unpleasant entirely. Now, why you'd want to perceive the pleasant as unpleasant is beyond me, but the other two seem much more useful. Um, in particular, transcending pleasant and unpleasant entirely. Um, as for the four-hour sit, it's only unpleasant for the first couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's really not that unpleasant. It's really not. Uh, it's, it's totally doable. Um, this one says, My parents really, really like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> And so I was raised Christian. Even though Christianity never stuck with me, I do find it difficult at times to let go of Christian teachings as I explore Buddhism. How do you feel about Jesus? And were you raised a particular religion you sometimes found hard to let go of? <laughs> Thanks. Well, as to how I feel about Jesus, so just recently uh, I started uh, reading through uh, everything Jesus said, every recorded saying of Jesus. Um, and I'm not actually all the way through, I'm about three quarters of the way through or so. And what I'm noticing is that Jesus said a lot of really nice things, like uh, love your enemy as yourself, um, uh, be kind to others, be humble, be meek, be generous. Uh, he said all these really nice things. He never said anything mean. He never encouraged intolerance or hostility. Uh, he never said any, anything um, about killing people of different religions. Uh, he never said anything in encouragement of uh, racism or sexism or uh, intolerance of any sort. You won't find a single shred of that in anything that Jesus said. So, I, I find it really bizarre that there's... Um, People who say they like Jesus, but then they do things that Jesus would be completely opposed to. I, I've always found that really strange. Um, so, for example, killing anyone, it would, Jesus would not approve. That's very, very clear. Um, intolerance and hostility, he would not approve. Um, Mm -hmm. supporting those who are poor or destitute or sick, that he would approve of. Um, so we see a lot of things which, which Jesus talked about, but which aren't necessarily being followed uh, by those who claim to be his followers. And of course, that's not universal. There's a lot of Christians who are really good people. Um, but there's also a lot of people who are, they might say they're a member of a particular religion, but they're not necessarily following its, its principles. <coughs> So the same goes with Buddhism, unfortunately. There's a lot of people who say they're Buddhist, but they're not following the Buddhist teachings. They're not following the principles of Buddhism. 
So it's, uh, and you find this in, in pretty much every religion. In every religion, there's some people who are following the actual teachings, and some, uh, probably most, who are not. Uh, so yeah, it's important to make a distinction there. Because, um, yeah, Jesus was a nice guy. Um, so I was raised a particular religion. <laughs> Uh, but I did not find it even remotely hard to let go of. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd also ask you uh, to then make a clear distinction between quote-unquote Christian teachings and the sayings of Jesus. So if you're finding some challenge there, go back and read through everything Jesus himself actually said. And you'll find it very difficult to find things that are substantially... Uh, in opposition to Buddhism. But then you go and like read a book of Christian dogma written by mm, some contemporary author and you'll probably be like, what is this? This clearly does contradict Buddhism in many ways, but it also contradicts Jesus in many ways. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but one of my family members calls herself... <laughs> calls herself Christian, but she espouses viewpoints that would make Jesus cry. <laughs> um, that would make Jesus break down in tears. It's actually really sad. Um, she support, for example, she supports killing a bunch of people. Um, I'm not even going to get into it. It's really awful. But she's quite convinced that she's Christian. I'm like, no. No, no chance in hell. <laughs> um, so you don't need to let go of, of the teachings of Jesus. He was a nice guy. Um, some people think he was a bodhisattva. I don't personally have an opinion on the matter. Um. There is a book on the shelf uh, on the subject matter from Thich Nhat Hanh, Jesus actually a couple. and the Buddha. There's a couple of books uh, by Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, one is called like Living Buddha, Living Christ or something. Oh, yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. There's another one called Going Home. Um, I think he has, I think there's another one up there as well. Those are the two I'm aware of. I haven't read either one, by the way. Um, but I hear they're good. Let's see. A lot of people, Dharma teachers included, at my Theravada-based Insight Meditation Center seem really just fine with the idea that they are the amalgamation of bad habits that they have to try to be more compassionate towards. I don't get it. Um, Aren't we supposed to be looking at wrong view as the cause of suffering of self and others? Uh, yeah, well, you've just discovered something, which is that those people are not Buddhist. <laughs> um, they might be practicing some things that are based on Buddhism, but I would, I would question whether they're actually Buddhist. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you think that your bad habits are something that you just have to put up with, you're not going to get anywhere close to awakening. There's no chance. Um, so yeah, we are, in fact, supposed to be looking at wrong view as the cause of suffering and working to overcome it. We are mm, supposed to be examining our unwholesome tendencies and doing what we can to change them. Um, just accepting that we're a mess is only the first step. The second step is to start cleaning up that mess. So I don't know who you're talking about in specific, but it sounds to me like they, they got the first step and stayed there. Because the first step, if you take it in the wrong way, it just sounds like affirmation. Like, I'm a mess and that's okay. Oh, okay, end of story. I guess I'm okay being a mess. Well you'll never get anywhere with that kind of attitude. If we think, oh, I'm just a greedy, selfish, hostile person with no concentration, no insight, oh well. Well, oh well indeed, that's the end of the story. You'll just continue to be a greedy, selfish, hostile person with no insight. Um, but if you want to change things, then it's necessary to recognize that everything that was just listed is subject to change. It can be changed, it can be trained away. It can be eliminated. And part of that involves letting go of our self-identity. Uh, the willingness to let go of who we think we are, 
in order to replace it with someone better, optimally an awakened being. Two, can you talk about people who do spiritual bypassing? What is it and how to deal with them? What is spiritual bypassing? I heard this term a few months ago, but I don't hear it terribly often. Can someone explain what this is? Anyone? What's spiritual bypassing? <laughs> spiritual bypass is something... Um, it's not like quite a guilt road, but it's good. Yeah, it's like uh, bad things don't matter because everything's impermanent, so we don't need to worry about it. Yeah, that's not Buddhism. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, three, can you talk about spiritual materialism? <laughs> what? <laughs> that's, that's, uh, um, Chayogyam Trunko Rinpoche talks about, that this is called... Spiritual bypassing? Materialism. Oh, no, no, I know what this oh. is. This says, can you talk about spiritual materialism, like secular mindfulness stuff? That, that's a quote, that's actually what it says here, like secular mindfulness stuff. So you get bonus points for the lingo. Me likey. Um, can you talk about spiritual materialism? Um, what comes to mind is uh, when I was a teenager, so after I lost faith in the religion I was raised in and before I got into Buddhism, then I went through a period of time when I was just like, sampling a bunch of different spiritual and religious traditions and kind of like cobbling together my own little personal eclectic mishmash of different things. Um, so I was including things that didn't really have anything to do with awakening. In fact, at the time, I didn't really have any idea what awakening was. Um, but I was just including things because I liked them or because they appealed to me or because I thought they were cute or interesting or fun or something. Uh, or because it appealed to my greed, or my hatred, or my delusion. Uh, and yeah, that, that wasn't remotely useful. Um, but then once I started getting into Buddhism, then it became clear. Like, if we want awakening, then we cultivate the things that lead, lead towards awakening, and we start setting aside the things that don't lead towards awakening. Um, so what comes to mind in spiritual materialism as the accumulation of spiritual practices um, as uh, out of greed or hatred or self-attachment, sometimes that's actually a starting point to genuine practice. Sometimes it starts off if, as like, well, I'm going to go to Mahasi retreat so that I can, uh, I can add that to my stockpile of stuff. And, and then I'm, I'm going to go to a Tibetan Buddhist retreat so I can add that to my stockpile. And, and I'm going to go to a Chan retreat so I can add that. And, and eventually something starts to transform in the mind. And we start to realize that there actually is a genuine opportunity for enlightenment. And we might start to become interested in that. Um, so as a starting point, I don't necessarily see a problem with it. Um, but it's also recognizing that ultimately it's all impersonal. Uh, like, if we want to finally attain enlightenment, we have to let go of all of our specialness. Um, so we can't be building a proprietary blend. Like, uh, Bhante Sudaso, registered trademark. Like, <laughs> uh, like, I don't just teach Buddhism, I teach Bhante Sudaso Buddhism. It's like, that's not going to fly. As long as we have that kind of mindset, we will never attain awakening. Because that's still, that's, uh, it's just an extension of our self-attachment, an extension of self-identity. So we need to be willing to just be another faceless, nameless Buddha. You fine with that? I'm fine with that. I don't need to be special, I don't need to have a special title, I don't need to have any special characteristics. Uh, as long as I'm a Buddha, I don't care what form it takes. So if we take on that attitude, we'll be totally fine. Next question. Can you tell us Stan's story? <laughs> it's better if he tells the story. <laughs> 
that he tells the story with his presence all the time. <laughs> his story is of, of someone who was abandoned and then found someone who loved him very much. <laughs> and now he's become uh, trusting and uh, faithful, happy, content. Well, as content as cats get, he's actually mostly filled with dukkha and craving. <laughs> <laughs> so it continues, how did he become your cat? He's not my cat. How, <laughs> uh, how old is he? No one knows. He's, <laughs> he's the cutest. It's true. <laughs> Uh, that one's a bit harder to argue with. Anyway, do you want to tell the story? Like, the actual story. <laughs> anyway, he was a shelter cat. Um, so he was in... A, well, shelter is really not the right word. Shelter is euphemism for um, execution chamber. <laughs> um, so, little known fact. Uh, how many cats and dogs get killed every day? A lot. Yeah. Um, something like 95% of the cats and dogs that wind up in shelters get killed. Six um, million a year. Six million a year. There you go. That's just disgusting. That's, That's just US. That's just so just in this country, we have uh, a uh, Nazi Holocaust every year uh, in the animal shelters. So I don't know why they call them shelters. It's the worst possible word because it's not a remotely accurate description of what they do there. Anyway, so he was in a shelter and he was about to be killed uh, and Giovanna decided she didn't want him to be killed. Um, so she got him. Um, and then when we opened the retreat center, uh, he came to stay at the retreat center because he helps us all practice metta. <laughs> He certainly helps me practice metta. <laughs> Who here thinks he helps us with metta? Yes. Okay, that's why he's here. <laughs> okay. Can you please talk about the Dharma and racism and implicit bias? in society and in dharma centers. I'm getting frustrated that so many white people say they want to tame their minds uh, or get insight or enlightenment, but when it comes right down to it, they get stuck in such a defensive mode and shame spiral, parenthesis, white fragility, that I just throw up my hands because I don't see it changing anytime soon. Thoughts? Well, <laughs> see, the challenge here is that there's there's several different angles I could approach this from. But I think I'm just going to come down to the most basic one. Ultimately, Buddhism is about transforming yourself. So, uh, and the Buddha even directly says, uh, in the Dhammapada, the Buddha directly says, don't look at what others do or don't do. Just look at what you yourself do or don't do. So is there racism in the world? There is. Is it an awful thing? Yeah, it is. Do I want it to go away? Yeah, I do. Do I think we should all do what we can to make it go away? Absolutely. Um, however, there's only one person who we can have a guaranteed benefit on, and that's ourselves. And as we work on ourselves, then that has an effect on others. Um, but if we just, if we, uh, if we're constantly looking at the faults of others and not looking at our own areas where we need to work, then we will never attain awakening. And the single greatest thing we can do for the benefit of all beings is to attain awakening. So, for example, uh, the Buddha, 
uh, the Buddha very frequently spoke out against racism. Uh, it's all throughout the suttas. Uh, so at that time in ancient India, uh, as it still is to this day in India, the prevailing form of racism was based on, on caste distinctions. Uh, so that was, it was all based on birth. So if you were born into this segment of society, then you were considered inferior to the people born in that segment, and so on. Um, and the Buddha just directly rejected it. Uh, he said this, this has absolutely nothing to do with reality. It doesn't matter what race someone is born into. What matters is what they do with their lives. What matters is what they do with their mind, with their speech, and with their body. That's what matters. What family they're born into? Completely <coughs> irrelevant. What race they're born into? Completely irrelevant. So the Buddha actively spoke against racism, and he had a distinct impact. Um, so if we attain awakening, then yeah, we're going to have a distinct impact. Um, it's possible that we can have a distinct impact even before attaining awakening. So if you can do that without giving in to anger, frustration, or resentment, then go for it. It's a really good thing to do. But in the meantime, don't get, I recommend not getting quite so worried about uh, other people falling into white fragility or... Uh, hypocrisy or whatever their issue is because that's their issue to figure out on their own. Uh, you can't force them to become better people. They have to eventually decide to become better people and do it themselves. Some people like to ask a lot of questions. Um, this is six questions all at once. It used to be seven, but somebody crossed out the last one. Um, let's see, one. Are current rebirth life's delusions a result of past life's attachments? When my body dies with a set of attachments, will my rebirth life have tendency to be drawn to them in my next rebirth? So the habits that we develop do stay with us between lives. So one way this manifests is, uh, for example, uh, a young child having an inexplicable obsession with surfing, uh, or, or a child who feels uh, like, like they have to be a painter. Uh, or a child who feels uh, very drawn to mathematics or something. Uh, that tends to come from previous lives. It's because in a previous life that person did a lot of surfing or a lot of uh, mathematics or a lot of painting or whatever. So that makes a, a strong impact on their mind. It means they have a strong tendency towards those things. So yeah, uh, the uh, attachments that we form, the habits that we form, um, carry over from life to life to a large extent. Uh, it's not always... Uh, it doesn't always manifest in the immediate next life. Like, sometimes it lies dormant for a period of time. But yeah, it's definitely there. Two, how do I draw the distinction between persistence versus attachment? For example, a doctor, researcher, who is driven to cure a worldwide disease which makes millions miserable, is he or she karmically okay as long as there's no attachment, such as frustration or anger or disappointment to the outcome of the perseverance? Yeah, that's fine. Um, in that situation, the thing to focus on is one's compassionate wish to help others. And then if things don't go the way you want to, then you just maintain equanimity. Uh, so you might try very hard and fail. So can you be okay with that? So practice being okay with not getting what you want. Practice being okay with things not going the way you want them to. Three, is having too many questions a form of attachment? <laughs> <laughs> Mainly to curiosity and the need to know. Well, it depends on what you're curious about and what it is you want to know. So just accumulating knowledge for the sake of accumulating knowledge, I'm not actually sure it's terribly useful. 
Um, so just accumulating secular knowledge in particular, I don't really see much value in, per se. Um, it can have some value in terms of understanding patterns of Dhamma that appear in ordinary life. So for example, once you have an understanding of Buddhism, and then you read some history books, then you'll recognize, oh, this politician was acting out of greed, and that politician was acting out of anger, and that led to this really awful thing happening, uh, this war, or this conflict, or whatever it was. So you can start to see the, the threads of Dhamma in, in secular things. But if it's just like you really love chemistry and you really want to learn everything you possibly can about chemistry, yeah, that's just a form of greed. It's just a form of desire, a form of attachment. It doesn't have anything to do with attaining awakening. And that desire for knowledge that does not conduce towards awakening uh, may actually inhibit you from making progress on the path. Ultimately, we need to be willing to let go of everything, including knowledge. So knowledge is not inherently good in and of itself. And yeah, uh, the desire for information uh, or attachment to having a lot of information can prevent you from attaining awakening. Or you mentioned a meditation that can help to see past rebirth lives. Is there one that can help to see parallel universes and lives? Well, uh, that's what the Avatang Sakha Sutra is meant to portray. The Avatang Sakha Sutra portrays when one attains awakening and then simultaneously perceives every single one of the infinite universes and infinite states of being all at once. So that's why the Avatang Sakha Sutra is really hard to get a grasp on. It's because it's presenting something that none of us have any way to directly relate to. Uh, it's still a really lovely sutra, so... Um, trying to get a handle on it can be uh, very productive, it can be very beneficial. Um, but as far as a technique that helps to see all the parallel universes, well, you just have to attain enlightenment, sorry. There's not really a shortcut on that one. Let's see. Five, I noticed that morning meditations are a bit relaxed and that afternoon nighttime meditations are a bit more intense. Can we spread them out more? Morning meditations feel like barely a joy, barely a jog, and night meditations feel like non-stop sprinting. So you want to do some non-stop sprinting in the morning as well? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> Well, uh, you can meditate right through the break times if you want to. I'm, I'm not, I don't have anything against that. Uh, in fact, if you want to just like sit completely still in your seat from, uh, let's see, uh, from 6 in the morning until uh, 10 a.m. at the work period, that's fine. In fact, there's your four-hour sit right there. Yeah, I'm totally okay with that. Yeah, if you want to make the mornings more intense, go ahead and make them more intense. Um, that said, I'll keep it a bit lighter uh, for others who want uh, who want to have more of a ramping up, more of a building up through the day. Personally, I find that useful because uh, in the beginning we wake up and, and the mind tends to be a little bit foggy still from sleeping. So then we come and we meditate and we're starting to build up rhythm, we're, we're building up speed, we're building up concentration. So that then when the afternoon and evening rolls around, we're ready to really dive in and stick with it. So personally, I find that approach a little bit more useful. Uh, but here's another option. Just practice equanimity towards the schedule. <laughs> so, this, is, this is one of the great things about meditation retreats, is that there's a schedule. And we just put down all of our preferences and follow the schedule. And then we start to see these things like, oh, I don't like meditating so much in the evening. I wish we meditated more in the morning instead. I wish we had longer breaks. I wish we had shorter breaks. I wish we had ice cream for breakfast. And I wish we had ice cream for lunch as well. And, and I wish... 
and, and I wish we could go and meditate on the beach. Oh, but it's so cold. I wish it was warm. And, and it's like, well, what are we doing? We're just making ourselves miserable, that's all. Um, or we can just stop and follow the schedule and use the schedule as a container in which we can find peace. That's what it's for. Okay, six. Why did you, parenthesis, the Bhante, <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, Bhante is a title. So you might have noticed in the suttas, they were, uh, when, when people were speaking to a monk, they called him Bhante. Um, so that's the title that was used in the time of the Buddha. Um, and that we still use today in many, many Buddhist traditions. So why did you, the Bhante, become a monk? Any particular stories? So it depends on what mood you get me in as to whether or not I answer this question. <laughs> so sometimes I answer this question in detail, sometimes I answer it briefly, and sometimes I don't answer it at all. You're not getting a detailed answer today. I'm pondering whether to give a short answer. <laughs> uh, why did I become a monk? Because I wanted to attain enlightenment. <laughs> I still do, uh, which is why I'm still here. Let's see. Last night you mentioned you're trained in Zen and Theravada Buddhism. Did you practice Zen exclusively before practicing and teaching Theravada? Yes. Yeah, I started off exclusively with Zen. And in fact, I had uh, quite a sectarian mindset. I had the, the mindset that Zen was the best form of Buddhism. Uh, the most direct form, the, the highest form, uh, which is a relatively common belief among Zen practitioners. Um, and then I started getting into Theravada for a variety of reasons. Um, one reason why is because in Zen they talk a lot about Zen masters and what this Zen teacher said and what that Zen teacher said, but they talk very little about the Buddha. There's very little that's said about what the Buddha said. It's mostly about like, well, this Zen teacher in the 13th century said X, Y, Z, and that Zen teacher in the 8th century said X, Y, Z, and that Zen teacher in the 15th said X, Y, Z. And it's like, well, what did the Buddha say? So one reason why I started to get interested in Theravada is because I wanted to learn what the Buddha himself taught, to really get in touch with the, the foundation uh, on which all Buddhist traditions uh, are based, on which all Buddhist traditions arise. Um, and also because Theravada has a lot of techniques and tricks and different toys and different ways of working with the mind. Um, so the school of Zen that I was practicing in, um, Soto Zen or um, Silent Illumination in practice, it's very sparse. You don't really have a lot of options in your meditation. In fact, you don't have any options in your meditation. <laughs> you have one technique, one technique, and that's it. Um, and that one technique happens to be extraordinarily difficult. Like, ex like just ridiculously difficult. Um, and it's a really good technique, it's just really hard. Uh, so, one of the reasons I got interested in Theravada is because Theravada has a lot of different options which provide uh, a range of ways of dealing with different mindsets. You know, there were other reasons, but that was a lot of it. Um, so then I exclusively practiced Theravada for many years and had quite a sectarian mindset there as well. Um, of thinking Theravada is the only true Buddhism, everything else is weird heresy that was <laughs> invented later, and uh, they're all just wasting their time, etc., etc. Uh, and then at some point I, I recognized that um, it's all just Buddhism. There's different forms, there's different styles, there's different practices, but it's all aimed at the same goal. It's all doing basically the same thing, and it all winds up in the same place. It's all Buddhism. It's all the path to enlightenment. It's just that different people respond better to different forms of teachings. Different people do better with different practices. 
So the different strains of Buddhism emerge based on what particular people found particularly were uh, beneficial for them, particularly useful for them. And then over centuries that becomes solidified into specific schools and specific traditions and specific sects. Uh, to the point where uh, eventually we get people even claiming they're different religions. Uh, but this is absurd. It's all just Buddhism. Uh, it all leads towards awakening. Two, I've noticed a few monks who study Zen before Theravada. Do you see a benefit? I see a lot of benefit in uh, making a sincere effort to see the good in multiple Buddhist traditions. Uh, because I... There's a lot of sectarianism in Buddhism, uh, of people saying, my tradition is better than yours. Uh, and I don't find that remotely useful. Uh, what's, what is accurate is to say, for me, this tradition is helpful right now. But also be open to the fact that that might change. You might be practicing Theravada now, but then in a few years you might find that uh, Chan Buddhism provides an approach that's particularly helpful for you. Uh, or you might mm, start mm, studying the Prajnaparamita Sutras and, and find it, it opens something in your mind. Uh, or you might uh, get into Tibetan practice uh, and, and start practicing Lam Rim or something along those lines. So be open to the possibility that you might find useful things outside of the form of Buddhism you're currently practicing. And also recognizing that the, there's not really sharp lines between different forms of Buddhism. They all bleed together at the edges. And generally speaking, the deeper you dive into one tradition, the more you recognize that the other traditions are really not so different from yours. That the, at, the, at the heart, there's the same essence. At the core, it's the same essence. As for Zen and Theravada in particular, I think there's a lot of benefit in the exchange between the two. Because as I mentioned uh, before, Zen puts a huge emphasis on absolute reality. Theravada puts a huge emphasis on conventional reality. So the two of those dovetail very nicely. They fit together very neatly. Also, uh, Theravada puts a huge emphasis on gradual practice, culminating in sudden realization. Zen puts a huge emphasis on sudden realization, supported by gradual practice. So again, they, they dovetail very neatly. Uh, it's just looking at the same thing from different sides. Uh, but it, it, they fit together very nicely. Next question. If most people don't want to be awake, how do you recommend that those of us who do want to be awake interact with them, family, friends, etc.? I find myself much less interested in their activities <laughs> and feel like I prefer my own company more and my cats. <laughs> that I would rather study dharma, or write, or practice, or even do something like yoga or tennis when I can focus attention. Yeah, that all sounds great to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, recognize that it's true, most people don't want to be awake, and so they're going to have a very hard time understanding why you're doing what you're doing. That's okay. Just be nice to them. Be friendly, be compassionate, be courteous, but don't let them drag you down. Stay focused on your path. And also remember that kindness and consideration to those who are not on the path is itself part of the path. Something my preceptor said to me before the first time I went to visit family as a monk. Uh, he said, you will never win your family over through arguments. You win them over through compassion. So, yeah, don't worry. So they don't want to be awake. That's their choice. You don't need to try to convince them. But just show them. Show them what a good person you are. 
by being a good person. Show them how happy you are by being a happy person. Show them how calm and content you are by being a calm and content person. And at some point, they might start to think, maybe this is because of all that Buddhism stuff. And they might get interested. Probably not, but they might. Um, and if they do get interested, and they start asking questions, then you can answer. But in the meantime, you're not at all obligated to get involved in whatever pointless secular activities that they're involved in. <laughs> if they invite you, then you can just politely turn them down to say like, oh, no, thank you, I don't feel like going deer hunting this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> or any weekend for that matter. Uh, but saying like, thank you for inviting me, it's so sweet that you want to include me, I'm, I'm not really interested in that particular thing. Maybe we can do something else together. Maybe we could go to an art gallery together. Uh, maybe we could go to the park, or find something else that you can do with them um, that doesn't disturb your practice. Okay, next question. At this rate, we're going to be here all night, by the way. <laughs> this says, there's enough room for everyone. Can you please ask everyone to leave some room and be considerate in terms of space? Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know exactly what this is referring to. Um, generally speaking, yeah, it's good to be considerate of each other. But also, the question I would also ask to the questioner here is to look at your own mind. Uh, ask yourself, why am I making a problem out of this? Uh, so it's true, we have more than 20 people, I think 24 or something. Um, we have almost 25 people living in close quarters for a week. That's a good thing. Because then we can start to see these attitudes arising in the mind. We can start to see those those attitudes of resentment or irritation or um, self-protection or, or whatever comes up in the mind. And we can recognize, oh, I'm making myself miserable. Maybe I'll stop. Maybe that would be a good thing. Maybe I'll develop love and kindness instead. So instead of looking at other people like, mm, I can't believe he's taking up so much space, how dare he? <laughs> instead it's like, oh, my beloved fellow practitioner, may he be happy, may he be joyful, may he attain awakening. <laughs> so changing the attitude, and then you realize that we actually do have more than enough space, and it doesn't matter how much space other people take up. We could all lie down on the floor, and there'd still be plenty of space in this room. We've done it in the past. Yeah, we have. <laughs> um, every now and then we get a teacher here who likes reclining meditation. Um, I'm not a fan because it tends to turn into snoring meditation. <laughs> but it is, it is something the Buddha taught. He did teach reclining meditation. So yeah, that's what I'd ask. Uh, so yes, do be considerate of each other, uh, but also be tolerant of those who are not as considerate as you want them to be. Yeah, and practice metta. Whoever wrote this, practice metta. <laughs> like, stop whatever else you're doing and just do metta. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> this says, can you briefly touch upon the lineages of Buddhism? Briefly. <laughs> well, uh, well, first, for the, the non-brief answer, you'll want to read a book called A.K. Warder's... Uh, it's written by A.K. Warder. It's called Indian Buddhism. Um, I've been requesting a copy for quite some time now, and it, still no luck. <laughs> but it's, it's on uh, the Amazon wish list. It's on the Amazon wish list. <laughs> it's lovely. It's about a thousand pages of all the information you could ever want about all the different lineages of Buddhism that emerged in the first 1500 years. Uh, so it, it admittedly doesn't cover things in the last thousand years, but realistically you don't need that because the seeds of everything in the last thousand years was sown in the first 1500 years. There's not really been much new in Buddhism over the last thousand years. Pretty much everything was already worked out in the first 1500 or so. 
Actually, virtually everything was worked out in the first thousand years. Um, briefly, though, uh, so Theravada uh, claims to be the oldest school, um, closest to the original teachings of the Buddha, and, and there's some good historical reasons to give a fair amount of weight to that claim. Um, Theravada emphasizes attaining awakening as quickly as possible through uh, dedicated effort, uh, particularly the cultivation of concentration and insight meditation. Uh, Theravada is what I mostly teach. Um, so everything we've been doing so far is, has been Theravada for the most part. Uh, then Mahayana uh, includes a, a variety of different forms of Buddhism. Uh, the one that's most well-known in the West is Zen, uh, or Chan, uh, as it's called in, in China and Taiwan. Um, so, uh, I've, I've already spoken a fair bit about, about Chan, about Zen practice. So it emphasizes direct, immediate realization. So just recognizing absolute reality just as it is right now. It's recognizing that absolute reality, by its definition, is always immediately present. So technically speaking, it is not necessary to practice over a period of time in order to get to awakening at some point in the future, because awakening is already right now. So Zen practice then is full of all kinds of things meant to help us realize truth right now, to awaken right now. Mostly taking the form of weird, cryptic sayings, which don't really seem to mean anything at first glance. Um, or like, odd little stories about like, the student goes to the master and asks, what is Zen? And the master hits him with a stick. And you're just like, what? <laughs> um, uh, so these are these these weird little stories and these these little short cryptic sayings though they're technologies that have been developed in the Zen school as ways of, of breaking the mind out of delusional thinking uh, in in the hopes that the mind will snap open to an understanding of the way things are and sometimes it works which is why these stories and sayings have been so carefully preserved over the centuries um, actual meditation techniques in Zen. Uh, there's really only two. Uh, so there's the silent illumination practice. Um, so uh, not doing anything whatsoever and allowing the true nature of reality to become immediately apparent. So as I said, extraordinarily difficult. Like ridiculously difficult. But technically possible. Technically you can attain enlightenment instantaneously right now through the practice of silent illumination. Realistically, it's going to take you a few decades, but theoretically you can do it immediately. The other major practice they use is koan contemplation, and there's different ways it's practiced, but usually your teacher will give you a word or a phrase or a sentence, and you just keep rolling that around in your head. And this word or phrase or sentence on its surface doesn't appear to have a logical answer or a logical meaning, and that's part of how it works. Um, it works by absolutely stomping your logical mind. Um, and, and so you keep turning it over in your mind until eventually things start to become clear. I don't have any personal experience with koan practice. I have a lot more experience with uh, silent illumination practice. So I'm not the best person to ask about that. Um, other major forms of Mahayana, uh, Pure Land Buddhism. Um, so Pure Land... Um, So Pure Land Buddhism is based on the principle of there being all these uh, effectively infinite parallel universes and all these uh, effectively infinite different world systems. So then the theory is that since there's all these effectively infinite world systems, then somewhere there's a world system where conditions are perfect for Buddhist practice, where conditions are just about as optimal as it can possibly be for developing our meditation practice and attaining enlightenment. Uh, and part of what makes it so perfect is that uh, in the Pure Land, as it's called, in this, this place where Buddhist practice is as easy as possible, there's a Buddha currently there, Amitabha Buddha, who is 
actively teaching, uh, actively teaching the path to awakening. Um, and who also, uh, he's made a vow that anyone who sets their mind intently upon him can become reborn in the pure land, where they can then practice as they need to, to attain enlightenment. So then pure land Buddhism uh, tends to focus more on firmly focusing the mind on the pure land and on Amitabha Buddha with the hopes of being reborn there. Uh, so that you can practice there. Um, the important thing to clarify here though, as, as David Liston recently pointed out, is that it is necessary for the mind to be completely focused on Amitabha, to be completely focused on the Pure Land. Uh, so you have to have Samadhi. You have to have one-pointed concentration. So in actual practice, uh, if one wants one's Pure Land Buddhist practice to be effective, then it's necessary to develop very strong concentration. Um, so many people practice Pure Land just by uh, like saying Amitabha's name a few times, and then they spend the rest of their day being a jerk and kicking cats and stealing from people. <laughs> Such people are never reborn in the Pure Land. It doesn't work that way. They still reap all the fruits of their karma. They still get all the bad results of that. Um, so there's, uh, there's a few other forms of Mahayana which are less well known. Um, they used to be more popular in the past, but they've mostly died out these days. Uh, but they had a strong impact on other forms. Um, so Tiantai Buddhism, um, uh, which survives mostly in the form of Tendai Buddhism in Japan, though it's, it's fairly small there. Um, which is a Mahayana school that bears a strong resemblance to Theravada. It uses a lot of the techniques that we find in Theravada. Uh, then there's the, the whole category of Vajrayana Buddhism. So forms of Buddhism that use a lot of esoteric practices, a lot of mantras and visualizations of different Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Um, so Tibetan Buddhism is the most well-known form of Vajrayana though there's also a surviving Vajrayana lineage in Mongolia and in Japan. Um, and those have then had an influence on the, the rest of Mahayana as well. Um, so that's a very brief overview. That was actually a lot longer than I wanted to spend on that. <laughs> it's hard to give a brief overview because there's so much variety uh, within Buddhism. And I've only just begun to touch on it because even like, even I spoke about Theravada. <laughs> I spoke about Theravada as though it was a single unified school, but it's not. It's not. There's dozens or hundreds of different subgroups within Theravada. So it's not accurate to talk about it as a single school, um, any more than it's accurate to talk about Mahayana as a single school. It's more like a category within which there are a wide variety of different traditions and forms of practice. Let's see, this one says, are some a modified version of old scripture? Oh boy. Well, that's getting into some controversy. Um, the controversy as to the origin of Buddhist scriptures. I'm not even going to touch that one right now. Um, what is to become of Buddhists in the age of technology? We are attaching ourselves more and more by the tweet. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't use Twitter for one um, I do use Facebook but only to spread Dharma and to support the operations of this organization which is all about spreading Dharma so technology is what you choose to make of it technology is not inherently good or bad it just is what it is it's a set of tools so it's like if you in the kitchen we have some knives they're just tools you can use them to cut the squash so that we can have soup tomorrow, or you can use it to cut up the pens so that nobody can write with pens anymore. You could use it to cut up the meditation cushions so we have nothing to sit on. You could use it to cut up each other so that there's nobody here to meditate. <laughs> uh, but the, the knife itself is not good or bad. The knife itself is just a tool. So if you use it for a good purpose, then it's a good thing. If you use it for a bad purpose, then it's a bad thing. But the distinction is in your mind. It's in your intention, it's in your purpose. 
So if you're using technology as a way of strengthening desire and attachment, then yeah, it's a bad thing. If you're using technology as a way of helping uh, you and others attain awakening, then it's a very good thing. Um, I got into Buddhism through the internet. Uh, I found monasteries through the internet. Uh, and most of you came to this center through the internet. So clearly, technology has some good uses. Also, what we call technology just varies depending on the age. Um, so, uh, 2,000 years ago, books were this hot new technology, and I'm sure there were people saying like, Oh, what is going to become of Buddhism in this age of books? <laughs> books are going to ruin the whole thing! And, well, now it's just unthinkable to have a monastery with no Buddhist books. That would just be weird. You walk in a monastery and you ask, where's the library? And they're like, we don't believe in books. <laughs> Awful things corrupting the minds of our youth. Well, that would just be weird. How are you going to learn about Buddhism if you can't read any books? Um, rhetorical question. Uh, so yeah, technology is okay. Uh, it's us that are not so okay. <laughs> <laughs> this says, what is transcendental meditation and its purpose? Uh, transcendental meditation, um, as I understand it, it's a form of mantra meditation that was popularized back in the 60s. Um, there's still a handful of devoted followers these days, but its popularity seems to have died out between now and then. Um, as I understand it, you're given a mantra, and you just repeat your mantra over and over and over again. That's it. So, from my perspective, that's useful as a preliminary method for reducing discursive thinking. But after a certain point, once discursive thinking has been overcome, then it's time to drop the mantra and do something more pointed, more specific. So as I see it, it's a preliminary technique. But if we use it as our sole and only technique, we won't get very far in our practice. Next question, can we try this? Yes, your mantra is focus. <laughs> <laughs> just, repeat the, just repeat the mantra focus in your mind over and over again until the thinking stops, and then do mindfulness of the body and the perception of impermanence. <laughs> <laughs> and it says, is it a feeling or an altered mind state? You'll find out, won't you? <laughs> Next question. I feel like I barely made a dent in this pile. <laughs> um, okay, we might need to put out a stapler. This person <laughs> tried to do makeshift staples, which worked out pretty well. Bonus points, wow. <laughs> wow, this is super clever. Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, what use do you have, if any, for the Abhidharma and its applications, helpful and unhelpful, in and or to the West? Where does it fit in with Western psychology? Uh, well, there's different strains of Abhidharma. Uh, so the Theravada Abhidharma is one that has survived more or less intact. Uh, the Abhidharma Kosha is another which has survived more or less intact, but as far as I'm aware, those are the only two that have survived in a complete form. Um, there were several different versions of Abhidharma that emerged in the first few hundred years of Buddhism, and they're quite different from each other. They're actually dramatically different from each other in some ways. Again, when you read uh, A.K. Warder's book, uh, Indian Buddhism, he talks about the different strains of Abhidharma. Um, so that's something important to keep in mind when studying Abhidharma, is that there are drastically different versions of it, and also that the different forms of Abhidharma um, are almost certainly not the words of the Buddha. They're almost certainly productions of mm, scholars, monastic scholars, who were attempting to codify the teachings, or to condense the teachings, or to systematize the teachings in some way. 
Um, so I wouldn't get too hung up on Abhidhamma. Um, generally speaking, I think it's much, you're much better off reading the suttas. Uh, the suttas are very practical, they're very down to earth, they have lots of great stories and similes and examples, um, provide a lot of useful tools for working with the mind. Uh, as for Western psychology, the interface between Buddhism and Western psychology is a, a larger question that I don't want to go into in too much detail right now. Um, briefly speaking, Buddhist practice is for the sake of enlightenment. Western psychology is not. I've never once read, so I actually studied psychology in, in university for some time. And never once did I encounter anything about enlightenment. It's just not talked about at all, because it's not the point. Um, as far as I can tell, Western psychology is it's primarily about helping people fit in with society. It's about helping people be functional members of society. Which doesn't have much of anything to do with Buddhism. And in fact, in Buddhist practice, you might find you become less functional in society. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. There's also a lovely story. Uh, we had a, a monk here recently who, uh, he said that he was, uh, he was at a, a conference where there were a bunch of people from different disciplines. So he was a Buddhist monk, but there were also psychologists and scientists of various kinds there. And he was, there wasn't enough rooms for everyone to have their own room, so he was housed together with a psychologist. And so the first day, he meets his roommate and seems to be going all right in the beginning. They were started off friendly. Then the second day, he noticed the psychologist was kind of giving him the cold shoulder and was, was actually acting kind of fearful. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the third day, like the psychologist was really like not doing too well at all. So the monk just finally approached him and was like, what's going on? What's wrong? And the psychologist said, you smile too much. <laughs> Smiling all the time is a sign of mental illness. You need to seek therapy. There's something wrong with you. And the monk was like, I just smile all the time because I'm happy. So like, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, anyway, side point. Uh, yeah, Buddhism and Western psychology, there can be some overlap in, in technique at the initial stages, but they rapidly diverge because they're not aimed at even remotely the same thing. Two, if people have experienced severe or mild developmental or shock trauma, it's often said meditation with its focus on the mind can do more harm than good. Who says that? Uh, yeah, don't listen to those people. Jesus, I don't know where they come up with this stuff. I think, yeah, they just don't know what they're talking about. Oh, if done unsupervised. Well... Anything, if done unsupervised, can cause harm. I mean, that's not really saying much of anything. Um, often a body-oriented approach like yoga is recommended. What are your thoughts on this? You'll notice that I emphasize mindfulness of the body. Uh, mindfulness of the body is, is actually great because, for many reasons. But one reason why is because it's much harder to get lost in delusion when you're focusing on your body. If you're focusing entirely on the mind, then it's very easy to get lost in the mind to get lost in the imagination or um, daydreaming or storytelling or uh, mental fabrications that can very easily spin out of control. So mindfulness of the body keeps us grounded in uh, a physical experience that helps keep us, helps keep us on track. Um, that said, I do generally think that before one has developed a very thorough and clear understanding of what Buddhist practice is and how to do it, that it is good to be in contact with teachers. Um, whether you have a mental illness or not, it's still good to be in contact with well-experienced, well-learned, orthodox Buddhist teachers. Double underline under orthodox. Um, 
Because, yeah, they'll help make sure that you're not getting off on the wrong track. But things like dealing with uh, developmental or shock trauma, yeah, you'll work through that in your meditation practice. Uh, that's not really an issue. Um, yeah, I'm not really big on this, this idea that one sometimes encounters this day that some people say that Buddhism is lacking certain important things that you can only get through Western psychology. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, the only individuals who I've ever seen proposing this view are people who don't seem to know what Buddhism is, who don't seem, don't seem to know what the Buddha taught. Um, so yeah, if we don't understand Buddhism, then we might think that it's incomplete. We might think that there's something missing. But when we understand Buddhism, we realize that Buddhism is a complete path to awakening. There's nothing missing there. There's nothing incomplete. It is complete yeah. as a path to awakening. It is not necessarily complete as a path to fitting in with society. Because society is insane. <laughs> society is completely bonkers. Why would you want to fit in with that anyway? Okay. Uh, it seems that Hiri and Otapa are not readily distinguished anymore in our society. And that people either get caught in toxic shame, which is based on the self-ego and leaves no room for thinking about others when one is obsessed with a sorry self. But it also seems that as a society, we have taken things... Some people really like to write. I'm starting to get worried about this. Okay, I think... You might consider just relaxing during the breaks instead of <laughs> writing these really long treatises. Um, I mean, I like Q&A, but I think, yeah, this is, this is getting more in the domain of essay writing than q <laughs> But it also seems that as a society, we have taken things a bit far and we no longer have healthy remorse. Where are our basic ethics and morals as a society? Capitalism is based on maximum profitability, exploitation, and taking things to scale. This goes against Buddhist teachings of sustainability, equanimity, interdependence, etc. So what are we to do? Work on your own mind. That's what you're to do. Um, so develop your own sense of conscience. Um, so Hiri and Otapa are uh, these, these basic qualities of of conscience, of a clear sense of right and wrong, uh, coupled with a, uh, a natural tendency to avoid doing unwholesome things. That's Hiriyotapa. So shame, yeah, shame doesn't have any place in Buddhism. Shame is unwholesome. It's just a form of self-hatred. Uh, remorse also is a word that uh, I'm very hesitant to use. Uh, because remorse also contends to contain unwholesome elements. Rather, what we want is the ability to recognize when we've done something wrong, to vow to not do it again, and to forgive ourselves for having made an understandable mistake. We're not enlightened, so sometimes we're going to make mistakes. That's to be expected. So when we recognize we've made a mistake, learn the lesson, vow to do better in the future, and forgive yourself and move on. Let it go. Let's see. Since I've been on this path three years, um, I find that while... Three years, you're just getting started. I find that while many things can still annoy or irritate me, I respond differently than I used to. I don't take things so personally and recognize it's usually someone's or my ignorance or conditioning that has created their wrong action. And I try to send them metta and let it go. Still, I have lingering and or old resentments, but I know where they come from and that they are not useful. But they persist and pop up in dreams, etc. Any suggestions on how to deal with this? Sounds like you're on the right track. Just keep up with it. So recognizing that the resentments are unwholesome um, and that they're uh, based on your own defilements and that ultimately are something that you need to let go of and get rid of. That's already a huge step in the right direction. So you're establishing that basis of understanding, uh, which is foundational for, for progress on the path. Okay. I might have to save some of these for tomorrow.
Yeah, we've been at this for an hour and a half. <coughs> okay. You talked about pain yesterday and sitting through it. Does this hold for, say, a torn muscle or sports injury, or for a car accident injury, or for cancer pain? Uh, yes, to all of those. Uh, when is a pain meter helpful to doctors at a medicinal level? Are you a doctor? Uh, so, um, basically, whenever you're experiencing pain, Recognize the sensation and train yourself to not suffer about it. Buddhism is about learning how to not suffer. It's about learning how to be happy and content no matter what. So whenever you're experiencing pain, no matter what kind of pain it is, try to learn how to be okay with it. And that does involve a willingness to face it. But also being realistic. Uh, being realistic when you recognize that the pain you're experiencing right now is absolutely off the charts uh, and that uh, it's beyond your current ability to handle um, and that some anesthesia would would help bring you bring it down to a more manageable level um, then yeah I can I can understand why you're doing it in that case but there's a, a something which really struck me about Shunryu Suzuki Roshi who was a, a Zen teacher who um, came to this country in the 60s. He had terminal cancer, and he was in an enormous amount of pain. Um, and his doctor prescribed him opiates, as is fairly standard practice for severe pain. Uh, so, he took one of the pain pills, and then an hour later, when the pain pill kicked in, uh, he took the bottle of pills, gave it to his attendant, and said, flush these down the toilet. I'm never taking these ever again. It's like, it's too damaging to mindfulness. It wasn't worth it to him. It wasn't worth it to him to sacrifice his mindfulness just so that he would have less pain. So then he spent the rest of his time, and he died of cancer, he spent the rest of that time without using anesthesia of any sort. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't see it as being worth sacrificing his practice for the sake of, of having less pain. That said, I was quite annoyed when I went to a dentist several years ago, and he said, oh, you're a Buddhist monk, that means you don't need anesthetic. And I was like, <laughs> no, I want some freaking anesthetic. It's like, if you're going to be doing surgery on my mouth, give me some anesthetics. <laughs> See, this one says, Does bad karma towards a person or a thing make me become that thing person in my next rebirth? For example, would womanizers be reborn as women unless they are reborn as a lower being? Are serial killers reborn as victims? Oh, karma is not necessarily quite so predictable in its specific details. Um, what we can be sure is that we will experience results in accord with what we've done. So if we harm others, we will experience harm. It's likely to be similar in some way to what we've done, but it may not be exactly identical because there's a lot of complicating factors. Uh, but it is often quite uh, quite similar. So the Buddha gives some very specific examples in the Chulakama Vibhanga Sutta, the, the lesser analysis of karma. And he says, for example, he says, if we injure people, then in future lives we'll have a lot of sicknesses, we'll have a lot of uh, physical problems. Uh, if we kill others, then in future lives we'll have a short lifespan. Uh, if we are uh, cruel and angry, then in future lives we'll uh, be ugly. Uh, if we're stingy, then in future lives we'll be poor. And then also the flip side, if we're generous, then in future lives we'll be wealthy. 
Uh, if we're kind, then in future lives we'll be beautiful. Uh, if we uh, help to treat those who are sick, then in future lives we'll be healthy. Uh, if we respect the lives of others, uh, then in future lives we will have a long lifespan. So uh, here the Buddha is giving a, what seems to be a fairly clear one-to-one -one correlation with karma. So that's, that's to give us a sense of the general shape of how karma works. But the specific details are much more complicated because uh, it's not like we just do one thing and we get one result. It's that we do thousands of things and all of that together influences exactly what experiences we wind up having in the future. I've often heard not to take revenge because karma will do it for me, but isn't it fair to say that if I did it, then I am the agent of karma? No. <laughs> I've heard this before. No. Um, you don't need to take revenge. Um, because actually it is true, the person will experience the results of their own karma. Uh, but also because when we take revenge on another, when we, when we harm another person, we are just generating more unwholesome karma, which then comes back to us. So we generate uh, whatever excuse we try to make for hurting other people. The truth is we're still hurting other people, which means we ourselves will be harmed. That's what it comes down to. So at some point, we need to just break the cycle and just say like, no, I'm not going to hurt people anymore. No excuses, no exceptions. What do you recommend if I live in a society culture of complete unawakenedness? Uh, for example, if I live in a corrupt government state country and I notice those in authority who abuse power, gee, I wonder what country you're talking about. <laughs> I feel the agitation to restore the right, uh, while at the same time those in power are manipulating the words of Buddha con to control the people into being non-acting and mindlessly obeying civilians. Is doing nothing and being detached the way, even if they are actively persecuting good people? Um, that's, that's more challenging. So you need to, to try to discern for yourself how you can have a positive impact um, without unnecessarily putting yourself at risk. And usually what it comes down to is, first, practicing well yourself, so being thoroughly committed to your own practice, and then doing what you can to, to help others uh, with their practice as well. Um, as far as uh, influencing government, um, so there are some avenues that we can have, uh, depending on, on where you live. Uh, there are some things we can do to try to influence the government to make it more, more ethical. So you're welcome to do what you can to try to make a difference there. Um, but also recognizing that where we can have the strongest impact is in our daily life and with other people. Um, so you just do what you can uh, at every level, uh, but without any resentment. Recognize that those corrupt government officials are delusional. That's why they're doing the awful things they're doing, because they're delusional. And they're incurring a tremendous amount of bad karma and they don't even realize that's what they're doing. That's really sad. Try to bring up some compassion for these people. They're not just hurting other people, they're hurting themselves. And they don't even realize that's what they're doing. So try to, at the bare minimum, try to have pity for them. But if you can, try to have genuine compassion. Next question. Is gratitude a type of murita, like murita for the good that has been done for you or for your own good actions that lead to good outcomes? I wouldn't think of it in that way. Um, <coughs> no, no, I wouldn't think of it that way. No, gratitude is one thing, murita is something else. 
In the past, you have emphasized that Buddhism and psychotherapy are different philosophies with different goals. Do you have any advice for Buddhist practices to help with particular psychotherapeutic diagnoses? For example, metta or gratitude practice I find helpful for depression. Do you know anything to help with executive functioning? Executive functioning is the ability to plan tasks and do them. People lacking in executive functioning might have difficulty planning realistically or adapting to unforeseen obstacles. Yeah, just keep doing your practice. Um, and I wouldn't worry about it so much. Um, You recommended a meditation journal last night. Journals fall squarely in the category of things that are pretty difficult for me. Any advice there as well? Uh, well, to be perfectly honest, I've never kept a meditation journal in my entire life. <laughs> um, just because I was never interested. But it's something that I know some people do and some people find helpful. Um, are there any poly adjectives between Arya Savaka and Asuttava Patujana? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, no. Which, again, is part of why I am of the opinion that Arya Savaka also includes those who are trying to practice, those who are, who are at the beginning of the path. Uh, four, how do we notice cessation? Doesn't that require memory? All we have right now is what has arisen. How do we notice absence? Look for it. This, uh, I, I was pointing to this earlier. One of the very interesting things that we notice when we start to focus on the perception of impermanence is that it is possible to simultaneously perceive both the existence and the non-existence of any particular thing in exactly the same place in exactly the same time. Don't take my word for it, but try to do it. So noticing cessation then is then can be taken to mean noticing the quality of non-being that is present in any particular thing. Notice how everything automatically implies its own absence. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one person out of 24. I can live with that. <laughs> um, as for using memory to notice cessation, that's actually a perfectly fine way to start. So in the beginning, you might use memory to help you notice what's going on. Um, but as your mindfulness and concentration sharpens, and as you get more proficient with the perception of impermanence, then you'll recognize that you don't need memory, because you can see arising and ceasing right in the present moment. Um, you'll also recognize that they're happening simultaneously. That it's the, the quality of any particular thing is insubstantial. So the quality of any particular thing is both existence and non-existence. It is both arising and ceasing. It's both coming into being and ceasing to exist. Uh, it's uh, present simultaneously. I'll talk about that more tomorrow. Who's excited? <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> Do you know of any enlightened people living today? Yes. <laughs> uh, oh, there's stuff on this side. This is not. If you can open psychic phenomena, th phenomena through meditation, is there a meditation to close it? For example, if you're a person that sees or hears spirits and has visions but doesn't want to, can you close those channels through a specific meditation? I'm not the best person to ask, uh, because I'm not personally very sensitive to such things. Um, so I've never had need to learn how to close off that sort of thing. You're better off talking to someone who's had experience with dealing with that. That's a bit too specific for me. Um, also, asking yourself why you want to. Uh, I would, you, you might instead practice equanimity. Just recognizing this is what's going on in the mind. It's not a problem. It's just the way things are. So cultivating equanimity towards the, the psychic phenomena that you're experiencing. 
This one says, does Buddhism have a concept of original sin as you would find in the Abrahamic religions? What is original sin again? That you're born um, with sin. What does that mean? <coughs> um, the idea that uh, people are, basically you're doomed to go to hell unless you repent. You already did something wrong. Um, well, that's a little bit different, I think, between Catholicism and evangelical like, Christianity. Evangelical mm -hmm. crazy. It's, it's also okay. You just said that on Facebook Live. Okay. Uh, so that that's also worth pointing out then that there's there's many different varieties of Christianity, uh, particularly within within Protestantism. There's a huge variety. So the the repent or go to hell form of Christianity is one particular form, which personally I don't think Jesus would be terribly happy with. Um, but it is there. Um, so uh, what we do find in Buddhism, we find a few things. One is that the mere fact that we're experiencing this state of being is because of our delusion and craving. So that, you might say, bears some correlation to original sin, though I have a feeling they're somewhat different concepts. <coughs> uh, but we also, in Buddhism, we also talk about Buddha nature. Uh, we talk about the fact that every single one of us has the quality of an awakened being within us. Every one of us has that, the capacity to manifest that quality. Um, and on the, on the more profound side, it's that this is in fact a manifestation of Buddha nature. This is a manifestation of Buddha mind right here. So this is already a manifestation of Buddha mind. So that, that's actually the polar opposite of original sin. It's original purity, original perfection. So we have both. We have both original sin and original purity. And they coexist simultaneously without any contradiction. Uh, Westerners would probably do to focus more on the original purity part. Um, can you explain Mahamudra, Dzogchen, uh, open awareness practice? When is it useful and when is it not? So I'm not hugely familiar with Tibetan Buddhism, but my understanding of Mahamudra and Dzogchen is that they're extremely similar to uh, Soto Zen or to silent illumination Chan practice. So my understanding of when it's useful, it's useful when your mindfulness and concentration is extremely strong, uh, when you have a clear understanding of the nature of uh, the three universal characteristics, when you have a clear understanding of the nature of emptiness, uh, and you know, uh, and you have some experience with the perception of emptiness, with the perception of impermanence. <coughs> uh, then you don't need to specifically direct the mind uh, because the mind has already been trained to recognize the, uh, the natural state of phenomena. It's already been trained to recognize emptiness. So you can just let it do its emptiness recognition thing. You don't need to train it at that point, you just let it do its thing. But if you're not yet to that point, then you might want to do some training or some study uh, so that you have a clearly calibrated sense of what the nature of reality is. Uh, and also, again, without mindfulness and concentration, it's very difficult to get anywhere with any form of insight meditation. So, silent illumination practice, Mahamudra practice, Dzogchen practice, these are all technically forms of insight meditation. Uh, so, without mindfulness and concentration, insight meditation is doomed to failure. It just doesn't get anywhere. I think this is a paper airplane. That's adorable. Okay. What are the bodhisattva precepts? Okay, since we're running late, I'm just going to tell you to look this one up in the books. Uh, let's see. Yesterday you said that people in our current life will play a part in the next... Is that all random, or do people play specific parts or roles throughout rebirth? 
For example, will my mother be reborn as another family member, or could she be someone I happen to meet once in our next lives? I guess I'm wondering if the people we are reborn with have purpose that's specific to us. No. Uh, basically, it's... Uh, everyone you meet has been every possible relationship to you at some point. Um, so he used to be my mother, um, he used to be my pet dog, he used to be my meditation teacher, he used to be my worst enemy, he used to be my best friend, he used to be my boss, he used to be my employee, he used to be everything, at one point or another. Um, so people will not necessarily play a predictable part. The part that people play in our lives has to do with our karma. Uh, well, our experience is the result of our karma, and their experience is the result of their karma. Uh, so, we all, we, we keep running into the same people over and over again because of our karma. Because of the connections that we form with those people. And also because over the uncountable span of lives, it's just inevitable that you'll start running into the same people over and over again. Uh, it's like if you ride the A train at 6 a.m. every single day, eventually you'll start to notice the same people on that train. Well, it's like that. We've been riding samsara, life after life, for countless eons. So at some point you start noticing, like, I think I know her. I've never met her before, but I think I know her. He feels really familiar. Why do I love this cat so much? It's just little things like that. Yeah, and it's because you've known them in previous lives. So the stronger that initial connection is, the stronger your connection was in previous lives. Next question. <coughs> there are people obsessed with jhana states who can experience high levels of concentration, but who aren't very wise or kind or altruistic. What do you have to say about that? That they're not practicing Buddhism? <laughs> um, next question. Um, again, concentration is a tool. It's like a knife. What are you going to do with that knife? So someone who like, gets a really beautiful sharp knife and then just hangs it up on their wall and stares at it all day? You're kind of missing the point. Jhana is a tool that we use to support our insight practice. But if we're not doing insight, the tool is useless. It's just a pretty tool, that's all. And also, our practice is... Uh, supported by all of the moral developments, uh, including kindness and generosity and so on. And also, morality is a product of genuine, sincere practice. So if somebody has strong concentration, but they're missing every other element of the path, yeah, I'm not impressed. Yeah, that's not, not what the Buddha taught. People have been practicing concentration since beginning this time, um, mostly outside of Buddhist contexts. And if you just practice concentration, you won't attain enlightenment. Concentration by itself merely leads to pleasant rebirth. That's it. And it doesn't lead to enlightenment. Are deep levels of concentration mandatory to develop insight? Yes. Is insight possible without deep levels of concentration? No. Uh, if you try to develop pure insight, one, it'll be fairly superficial, but what you might recognize at some point is that constantly putting the mind on insight, it starts to develop a certain degree of concentration. So if you then take that concentration and run with it to the point where the concentration becomes strong, then your insight practice will also become strong. Yeah, as I understand it, without some degree of strong concentration, uh, your insight practice can't get, can't get very far. How many suttas are there? A lot. <laughs> I have heard that the Buddha accepted gifts of slaves. I don't know who told you that, they were wrong. The Buddha 
did not accept slaves, and he also stated very clearly that that was not something that we should be engaged in at all. No, he clearly stated that uh, buying and selling human beings is wrong livelihood. It's not wholesome, it's not appropriate, it's not to be done. Uh, he also specifically said that monastics should not accept gifts of slaves. That's one thing that, that we're not allowed to receive. Similarly, it's not something to be involved in. Since nirvana does not exist without samsara, are not samsara and nirvana of the same meaning? It's our perspective and how we relate to things that is important, creating either suffering, <coughs> samsara, or peace, nirvana. It isn't accurate to say that nirvana does not exist without samsara. Rather, it's accurate to say that concepts of existence and non-existence have no relevance to nirvana. That's more accurate. So this is where I wonder how much I should say. Because there's always a risk of confusing things rather than clarifying things. So it is not accurate to say that samsara and nirvana are the same. But it's also not accurate to say that they're separate. Uh, also, all of samsara is contained within nirvana, uh, and nirvana is readily, uh, readily evident in every part of samsara. That would be a more accurate statement. But yeah, how we relate to things is what is important. Um, and every moment we have the opportunity to either uh, experience uh, peace and wisdom or to experience agitation and confusion. We always have that choice. So I think the choice is relatively clear. Um, even though we don't always seem to make the right choice. This one says, is it possible to turn up the heat in the meditation room? <laughs> it is possible. You'll have to convince this person. No, it's not. This okay. is already at max. All right. There's your answer. It's minus 10 Celsius outside. Okay. There's your answer. No more heat. <laughs> um, if you want more explanation, you'll have to ask her. So in many monasteries, there's no heat at all. <laughs> so be happy that we're making things a bit more comfortable. Okay. Do you have to believe in devas, gods, parallel human worlds, parallel universes to become enlightened? Yep. More accurately is that with enlightenment, you recognize that all these things are inescapable. Just no getting around it. So it's not that you need one in order to get the other, it's that the two come hand in hand. Two, how does the Buddha know what previous Buddhas said? Well, um, the Buddha could recollect all his past lives. Um, so either he was present at a time when another Buddha was speaking, or he had a memory of someone who was present reporting to him what was said. Um, we had a memory of reading what a previous Buddha said. Uh, so there's many ways he can come across that kind of information. There's another way of answering this question, which has to do with the nature of a Buddha's knowledge. Yeah, we're not going to go there. Uh, what is the difference between dualistic thinking versus wisdom? 
Does an arhat know when he is hungry? What's to keep him from walking off a cliff? <laughs> yes, arhats know when they're hungry, and no, they don't walk off of cliffs. Um, so that's called functional activity, or functional awareness. This is one useful thing from Abhidhamma, by the way. Uh, they, they make the distinction that an enlightened being uh, has functional abilities. Um, so the ability to know when they're hungry and to eat when they're hungry, the ability to explain Dhamma, the ability to not walk off of cliffs, uh, that's all within the mind of, of an Arhat, because that's all, uh, it's all within human capability. So body and mind is still here after awakening. So body and mind still has within it uh, all the, the knowledge and techniques that were there prior to awakening, including things like eating when you're hungry and not walking off of cliffs. So it is not accurate to say that dualistic thinking is wrong. Um, nor is it accurate to say that monistic thinking is right. Both of these are limited perspectives. Uh, so in the Zen school they say it very simply. They say, not two, not one. Did you get it? Anyone? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Not two, not one. So it's not accurate to say uh, the universe is dualistic, and it's also not accurate to say the universe is monistic. It's not accurate to say either that there are separate phenomena, nor is it accurate to say that everything is one. The other way to talk about it is that both of these perspectives are equally true. They're just different ways of talking about the same thing. So an arhat can use dualistic thinking when it's helpful, and they cannot use dualistic thinking when it's not helpful. Um, another way to see it, to talk about it is that they simultaneously recognize both dualism and monism. And they're not trapped by either one. They're not stuck on either one. Okay, we might actually get through all of these tonight. <laughs> um, the handwriting on a lot of these is similar. I think one person wrote about 15 questions. Uh, people still seem very restless during periods of formal meditation, especially when you are not here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Naughty, naughty. <laughs> If you only practice well when there's a monk in the room, your practice has some serious holes. Major problem. Uh, or, or to take another approach, just imagine I'm always in the room with you. Creepy. <laughs> so when you're at home practicing meditation by yourself, just visualize me sitting there in a corner staring disapprovingly. <laughs> Every time you start to shift your posture, <laughs> yeah, seriously. Uh, if you want to get the most out of the retreat, take your practice seriously. Um, so there are going to be times when I'm meeting one-on-one -on -one with people, so that means I'm not here in the main room. Uh, but keep on practicing your best, whether I'm here or not. So when I was meeting with people earlier today, I again heard people going up and down the stairs. There's no reason to go upstairs during meditation periods. Just stay down here and meditate. Um, can you please again remind people that when one sits quietly with minimal movement, one is supporting other people's practice as well? That's true, but also the person who wrote this question would do well to practice equanimity. Um, so, yeah, it's true that, uh, first off, we, we sit still, uh, we hold still because it's good for our own concentration. Uh, and this is really inescapable. If you want strong concentration, hold still. 
It makes a tremendous difference. <coughs> but also, we make an effort to be quiet because uh, before one has developed strong concentration, uh, it's easier to be distracted by sound. So as a courtesy for those who are not yet equanimous towards sound, we minimize the amount of sound we make. However, it's also part of our practice to be undisturbed by whatever we experience. So if there's sound, don't be disturbed by the sound. It's just sound. If there's sensation, don't be disturbed by sensation. It's just sensation. So we don't need to be bothered by sound. Did you hear the car going by? Was it a problem? No problem. So you hear somebody else shifting around? No problem. Doesn't need to be a problem. Um, if your practice can be so easily disturbed by someone shifting their posture, then you're, mm, I would look at that. I would look. Why am I getting so upset about this? and bring your mind back to equanimity. It reminds me of during the first three-month retreat I did. Uh, I was absolutely fuming because the other people weren't quiet enough. And I was just, I was just going around and just Pure hatred. I hate them. 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 <laughs> um, and then I, I, I went and I talked to one of the senior monks. I was like, can you please tell these people to be quiet? And um, he was like, maybe you should do more loving kindness. <laughs> Um, or to put it more directly, it's not that other people are disturbing us, we are disturbing ourselves. And at some point we realize that's what we're doing, and we decide to stop. Um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Also, this is a short retreat, it's only a week. It's nothing. Uh, I mean, you spend the first half of the retreat just settling in. Uh, usually it takes a good three or four days for people to settle down. Um, and at that point, the retreat will be almost over. Uh, so, if you're just waiting for people to settle down, don't wait. Just do your practice. Do it now. Do it now. Always now. This one says, As I practice and learn more about Buddhism, I continue to be surprised by how many Pure Land teachings are in Zen and how many Zen teachings are in Theravada. Do you think that it is fair to say that the different schools of Buddhism are illusory and result from teachers focusing on different parts of the Dharma? Would a non-sectarian approach be better? Yes to all of that. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of non-sectarian Buddhism. I would like to try and mimic the monastic lifestyle in my daily life as much as possible. I already live a minimalist lifestyle with few possessions, but there's obviously more to it than that. For example, two meals a day. Can you give suggestions on how elements of monasticism can be made part of everyday life for people with jobs and student loans? <laughs> well, first off, um, I recommend going and spending some time in a monastery. Most monasteries have programs where people can come and stay for a few days uh, without any expectation. In fact, they usually love it when people come and stay because it's free labor. <laughs> uh, but you'll still get plenty of, of opportunities to practice and to interact with the monks and nuns and to see what monastic life is like. And then you'll get a sense of what elements you want to bring back to your home, what elements you want to integrate into your life. So that'd be my recommendation. Start spending some time at monasteries. Um, Many places you can even just go for a weekend. Uh, you'll have to start contacting monasteries and see what, what their options are. Some places have a minimum stay of, of three days. Some places don't. Uh, most places have a maximum first-time stay. 
Most places you can't stay longer than a week or two your first time. Uh, but uh, second and third time and after that you can stay longer periods of time. Um, yeah, just go and start visiting monasteries and see what you want to take back with you. But also remember that the outward forms of, of monastic life are not inherently good. They're tools for training the mind. Uh, but they're not good in and of themselves. Uh, so if we take it, if we take on uh, monastic practices with the wrong attitude, it's not useful. Uh, if we're just fixating on the outward form and we're missing the underlying mind training, it's not useful. So, for example, uh, in, in many Theravada monasteries, there's no dinner served. There's only breakfast and lunch. Why is that? It's to help us practice renunciation, to practice equanimity towards hunger, uh, to observe our desire and attachments in relationship to food, and to let go of them. That's its purpose. But I recall reading in a Buddhist, well, Buddhist magazine a while back about someone who took on the monk diet in order to lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> Which is totally missing the point. So admittedly, I'm a pretty skinny guy. Um, but I didn't take on the monk diet in order to become a skinny guy. I was a skinny guy before I became a monk, by the way. Um, that's, yeah. so, so make sure you're using monastic practices for their intended purpose. Uh, and not just because it's cool or because you like it or because it makes you skinny or whatever other reason. This says, do you allow practitioners to do residential practice outside of retreats? That is, could someone come here for a month on their own, live, volunteer at the retreat house, and study with you? Uh, talk with me after the retreat. Um, since we have very limited space at this center, we don't currently have a lot of options for long-term residency. Um, and, yeah. Talk to me after the retreat and I'll explain to you in more detail what's going on. Um, so we, we do sometimes have people staying here, um, but there's, there's very specific limitations around that. So talk to me in person afterwards. Uh, it says, can you recommend a monastery in the, United, in the United States for someone who wants to take temporary ordination to further their practice? Not really. Um, Monasteries in the United States, the ones that I'm aware of, generally don't offer temporary ordination programs. Uh, you find that more in, uh, in Southeast Asia, particularly in Thailand and Burma. Um, there's a well-established culture of temporary ordination. Not so much in the Western world. Um, but as I mentioned before, you can go and stay at monasteries. Most monasteries you can stay for uh, months. Uh, in some cases, even years, without being ordained. Uh, that requires that you go for a short visit first and establish a positive relationship with the monastery. Uh, but it's quite possible to live a monastic lifestyle at a monastery without being a monk or a nun. Uh, in fact, I highly recommend it. It's a great thing. And you might also find, when you do that, that you actually want to take the extra step uh, of becoming ordained. Um, that said, ordination is not lifelong, so if you did become a monk or a nun and then after 5, 10, 20 years you decided that you want to go back to shooting deer and drinking beer, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is you're into doing, then you technically can do that. Uh, it is an option. The Buddha did make it an, an option that we can step out if we want to. Um, yeah, so I wouldn't be afraid of monastic life. Um, just go and spend some time at monasteries and see what it feels like, and you might decide it's something you want to stick with for a longer period of time. Okay, we're almost there. There's only a half dozen questions left. I'm getting very frustrated with myself. My lack of ability to deal with the pain and my mind will not stop. This is just causing anxiety or something in the chest resembling it, which only causes more agitation at my seeming total lack of ability to meditate. 
Any thoughts? Yeah, stick with it. You'll be fine. This is just one of the phases that we go through from time to time. Um, we have the times when our meditation is amazing and it's awesome, and we have the times when it's really challenging and difficult. <coughs> so, the, the thing is persistence. Um, just stick with it. You might also want to relax a little bit. Uh, it sounds to me like, in your case, part of the problem might be that you're actually trying too hard. And you're taking this all too seriously. Relax a little bit. Let your posture slump a little bit. Um, let the mind relax a little bit. Don't be quite so focused on the technique. Uh, stay alert and aware, but don't do anything in particular. Just let the mind relax a bit. And then when you're feeling ready, then you might start doing a particular technique again. You might also do more loving-kindness meditation. That really helps a lot. Uh, if you start to get a feeling in your chest that resembles anxiety, then uh, just focus on that feeling. Just pay attention to that feeling with equanimity. Just noticing it. It just it feels like this. And it's perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong. There's no problem. It's just the body producing sensations. That's what bodies do. And also reminding yourself that what we're doing here is extremely difficult. So it's normal that there are going to be times when it just seems impossible. So just recognizing, yeah, it's, it's natural. We're trying to do something really hard, so sometimes it's going to feel really hard. So don't be too hard on yourself. Uh, if you feel like you suck at meditating, you're not the only one. Everyone does. Mm -hmm. Everyone sucks at meditating. Mm -hmm. That's normal. <laughs> Earlier in your talk, did you say that everything already contains within it its ending? For instance, contained within each being is its cessation? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> How do you know that devas and spirits exist? Oh my gosh. Uh, rebirth is a tough enough pill to swallow. Didn't the Buddha say to only believe what you can verify for yourself to be true? Have you encountered any devas? I would love to believe, but these things seem hard to verify, and not unlike certain other religious dogmas that can't be proven. Make me a believer. <laughs> <laughs> When we consider the infinite spectrum of possible states of experience, we recognize that amidst all those possible states of experience, there is the experience of being a deva, of being a spirit. There's also the experience of having contact with devas and spirits. Those are all possible states of experience. Uh, if that's hard for you to, gra to get a grasp on abstractly, you might recall dreams you've had. Dreams when things happened which you would consider quite strange or far out in waking life, but in the dream it felt totally normal. It felt completely real. It felt just like when you're awake. It just felt like what was really happening. So then that was an experience. Uh, and you could have a whole lifetime of that experience. In fact, I, I recall having some dreams in my life where the dream went on... Actually, I actually remember once when I lived several days. Like, uh, the dream in the dream world, it was several days. Um, and then I woke up and it had just been an ordinary night's sleep. Um, so then, you could quite literally say that then I lived that lifetime for several days in that dream. Uh, and then it came to an end. Uh, because while we're in that experience, that's just our experience. This is part of why, why dreams are often so convincing, even when things are happening that are exceedingly improbable. Uh, because it's just what's happening, it's just our experience. So we don't question it any more than we question the experience we're having right now. Just as we assume this is real, when we're dreaming we usually assume that it's real. I'm setting aside the issue of lucid dreaming because that's a different issue entirely. Um, so then, 
uh, and then considering the the infinite spectrum of possible dreamscapes, of possible experiences we can have within our mind. And then we recognize, then we can have any of these experiences as devas or spirits. It's all possible. It's all within the domain of possibility. And since our experience is all our mind anyway, since everything we experience is within our mind anyway, then it naturally follows uh, that mind-made experiences are just as real as everything else, because everything is mind-made experiences. The Buddha lays this out quite specifically at the beginning of the Dhammapada. He says, uh, mind is the precedent of all things, mind is the most powerful of all things, mind is the creator of all things. Uh, in other words, our mind creates our reality. So if you can imagine something, then you can experience it. Can you imagine devas? Then you can experience them. That's one way of approaching the issue through logic. As for your question, have I encountered any devas? The answer is yes, but I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to give any detail on that one. But for now, we'll just say yes. Um, but again, it's not necessary. Logic is all you need. So uh, it's not complete to say that faith can only be based on direct experience. Faith can be based on direct experience and logical inference. That's an important thing to include. Next question. Is unconditional love really possible? Yes. Which is why we're doing loving kindness meditation. So this is indeed the goal of loving kindness meditation. I ask because they say that unconditional love is something you truly experience when you have kids. <laughs> <laughs> This sounds like the kind of things that people who have kids say to try to convince other people to have kids. I think this arises from the saying, misery loves company. <laughs> uh, they're just like, I love my kids so much. <laughs> you should have some too. <laughs> So this person continues. Uh, so they say unconditional love is something you truly experience when you have kids. I don't, and I don't know if I will. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, yeah, actually bonus points. Um, so if you have kids, that makes it a lot more difficult to become a monastic for one thing. So if you have if you see even the slightest possibility of ever wanting to enter monastic life, don't have kids. The other thing is that um, children carry, having children carries an enormous carbon footprint. So if you're interested, <laughs> um, if you're interested in combating, combating climate change, one of the greatest things you can do is to not have kids. <laughs> I'm not even making this up. Yeah, you don't need to have kids to have unconditional love. You can have it right now. It's very simple. That's what loving kindness is. Loving kindness is unconditional love. Okay. <coughs> Once I heard a monk describe a practice in which every time his mind clung to something throughout the day, he would gently and firmly tell it to let go, let go. Do you think this is a good idea? Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Okay. <laughs> Many people, especially Westerners, like to hate themselves. Yeah, I don't get that either. That's really weird. Why do people hate themselves? I don't get it. Yeah, don't. Don't hate yourself. It's not remotely useful. Hatred is always unwholesome. Whether it's directed towards yourself or towards another, it's still hatred, and it's still unwholesome. 
addiction to suffering. They think that because of their unwholesome conditioned habitual actions and tendencies that they are a bad person. Yeah, that's uh, also a misunderstanding. Uh, it comes from identifying as our actions, identifying as our choices, and not recognizing that those are just temporary things. Um, that whatever we did in the past is in the past, and we can choose to be a different person right now. Whatever personality traits we've had in the past, we can change right now. So we don't need to be the same person we were before. We can be whoever we want to be. So let's choose to be good people, starting right now. This is the foundation of wrong view. Everyone's true nature is basic goodness. So how do we encourage people to realize their thoughts of self-hatred may be real but are not true? Yeah, just what I just spoke about. Uh, so recognizing that we are not our habits, tendencies, personality, and so on, that that's all subject to change, that we can choose to change it at any moment. Yeah, that we all have the inherent capability to be uh, good people. We all have the inherent capability to be Buddhas, uh, if we so choose to. Two, self-compassion and shame resilience. Shame resilience? Much, I don't know what shame resilience is. Much has been made of the two lately, popularized by the works of Kristen Jeff and Bren Brown. I don't know who these people are. Both psychologists, researchers, PhDs often talked about in Buddhist circles. Yeah, apparently not my Buddhist circles. <laughs> I've never heard of these people. Um, I don't really pay much attention to psychologists, to be perfectly honest. I see these teachings as, uh, I see these teachings often to be dangerous because I see them as reifying a concept that is not true. Uh, would you have compassion toward a self that is already pure Buddha nature? Yes, compassion to unwise actions and habits, but not to a self. Um, Mm, that's kind of splitting hairs, actually. Um, so, more, more the way I would take this is I would take it from a different angle. I would say that we should strive to develop compassion for all living beings without exception. That's the angle I would take. So, this being is included in all beings. But not saying, have compassion for me, <coughs> because that is in fact self-centered, but rather it's saying compassion for all beings without exception. Then there's no self-identity getting mixed into the picture. There's no me or mine getting mixed into the picture. It's just all beings without exception. That's how I would approach the issue. Um, so, where, where bringing up self specifically can be useful as an antidote to someone who has a strong self-hatred issue. So, if someone is like, may everyone be happy except me, <laughs> and I have met people like this, then it's important to remind them, no, you are also included. May everyone be happy including yourself. May everyone be happy without exception. And making it clear, that includes you. So when we wish for all beings to attain awakening, that includes, uh, that includes this one. When we wish for all beings to be free of suffering, that includes this one. So no exceptions, nothing left out. That's how I would approach the issue. Um, so just dropping self entirely and just making it completely universal. In the same way, why should we be shame resilient? Doesn't that imply we are clinging to shame, which is just a thought? That's a good point. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm completely opposed to shame. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, shame just strikes me as self-hatred. Uh, just another form of, of self-hatred, which means we shouldn't tolerate it for even a moment. 
the moment we see any form of self-hatred arising in the mind, cut it off right away. It's just hatred. It's not wholesome. It's not useful. So, uh, again, I spoke earlier about the difference between conscience and shame. So conscience is the ability to recognize right and wrong, and to steer away from wrong. Uh, shame is self-hatred on account of a past choice. That's not wholesome. Uh, we can recognize that a past choice was unwholesome, and vow to not do it again, but without any trace of shame. There doesn't need to be shame involved at all. So, for example, someone asked about Hiri Otapa earlier. Hiri is sometimes translated as shame, but in my opinion that's a really bad translation, because it does create this confusion of, uh, between conscience and shame. Last question. <laughs> yeah, at this point we're hardly going to have any time for meditation. Okay, that's encouraging. I was half afraid people would cheer for that as well. <coughs> I appreciate your advice on how to bring the mind back to concentration. For example, you use focus, focus, focus. Spacing out these words also helps. 